and welcome to the Academy of Imperfection, a conversational lecture series where experts in their field share their wisdom on the subject of imperfection. Today, we hear from one of the world's leading scientific researchers in nutrition and food, Professor Felice Jacker. What you eat influences the microbes that are in your gut but then there's this direct link via the vagus nerve to the brain. Mm. For people trying to get their head around why what they eat might be linked to their mental and brain health, that's probably the most concrete way of thinking about it. So scotch your eggs and join students Hugh, Ryan and Josh in the Academy of Imperfection. Um, well, very, very uh, exciting and I'm, I'm sure it'll be extremely informative, Academy of Imperfection today guest lecturer, um, <laughs> Felice Jacker, Dr. Felice Jacker. Professor. Professor, excuse me. Take that back. <laughs> How offensive. <laughs> what is the difference between a professor and a doctor? Uh, well, in Australia, you have, it, it's like a promotion thing. You start off as a doctor. Right. And then you go up to senior lecturer. Then you go up to um, associate professor and then you become a professor. And in my case, I'm an Alfred Deacon professor, which means I'm sort of top of the food chain at our Whoa. university. Um, but very few people actually make that progression to full professor because it's very, very tough to survive in research in Australia. Mm. Uh, in America, it has a different meaning. A professor in America just means you're a, like a teacher or, or a lecturer, but I don't actually do any teaching. I, um, mm -hmm. you know, pure research. Gee, wow. Yeah. Good for yeah. us. Yeah. So, I, so I had a dream last night. Is it contextual to this? <laughs> <laughs> I was just like walking and I couldn't run. You know, like my legs were heavy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very contextual. I uh, I was thinking about the interview before I went to bed, and then I had a dream that I kept calling Felice Jacker throughout the interview, kept, <laughs> and, and you were really upset that I was calling oh. you Jacker, which is probably fair enough. Yeah. We have a joke in our team because myself and one of my senior team members, his name's Wolfgang, and everybody gets our names wrong. We have, you know, Felicia. He got Woolwang once, so he was often Woolwang <laughs> around the office. Wool like, it's not that just, hard. So what do we call you? Do we call you Professor? Is that the preferred? Yeah, well, that's my title, but just call me Felice. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So go with your name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How novel. <laughs> For the uninitiated here, who, who is Professor Felice Jacker? Okay, well, I've got quite a few things here and um, I'm not going to go through it all because it would take a long time because you are an extremely accomplished individual. So it's going to take forever to do that. So let me just, a couple of the highlights. In 2021, Felice was awarded a Medal of the Order of Australia for her services to nutritional psychiatry. She is the founder and president of the International Society for Nutritional Psychiatry No Research. longer president, actually. No That's, longer president. Yeah, for, as of uh, last year. Oh, right. Yes, okay. yeah, but I'm the founder and immediate past president. Immediate the past president. <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay. let's, just to let that sink in, founder of the International, what was it called? Society, Society for Nutritional, Nutritional Psychiatry Research. I mean, <laughs> we now know a lot about, I mean, Hugh, I'm sure you're going to go into this, but I feel like we know so, we know more and more about nutritional um, the links between nutrition and mental health, but the fact that you are the founder of that is quite extraordinary. Yeah. Felice's research focuses on how diet and nutrition impacts on our mental health. Felice began work as a researcher. She became keenly interested in why there was a lack of data on whether diet and nutrition had any significance on prevention or treatment of mental disorder. Felice set out to change this and in the process became a pioneer in the field of nutritional psychiatry. It is so exciting to have you here. I mean, this is a mental health uh, podcast. I myself, I would say in the last two or three years, have, have really felt the impact of eating really well and the impact it's had on my mental health. And so I can't believe it's taken this long to have a conversation with you, but it is just so great to have you here. Oh, it's great to be here. So before we get going, just uh, I'm interested in your um, history with health and mental health. It's obviously had a really big impact on the work that you do. Yeah. Yeah, I've had a very really interesting life. My background, my father was um, sort of the father of naturopathy in Australia, Alf Jacker, and he founded the Naturopathic um, College, Southern School of Naturopathy. And so I grew up in a family that was very unconventional in relation to medicine and, and food. And some of that stuff was really not good. A lot of non-evidence-based approaches, you know, no vaccines, for example, because, hey, they give you autism, you know, that sort of mm. non-evidence-based uh, stuff. But it did allow me to develop this idea or this paradigm of food as being very important to health in general. Um, but then when I was uh, in my early teens, I developed very severe um, uh, panic disorder. 
Genetics plays such an important role, um, and I've got a very strong genetic history of um, severe major depression, bipolar disorder, which many families do. You know, this is not uncommon. And what complicated things too, I think, was at the time that I was very anemic because I'd been brought up on an extremely strict vegetarian diet that was not very diverse. It just didn't, I think it was probably quite limited in its Mm. nutrient profile. And that anemia, once you start menstruating, really, you know, it had such a major impact. And then I I developed major depression, really quite severe. Is it in your teen years? yeah, Yeah, yeah. So from the age of 12 and then when I was 19, you know, after many years of, of dealing with quite severe anxiety and a major depressive disorder. And, of course, this is back in the day where we didn't know what these things were. There was no medical treatment. It was just wasn't discussed. I had no idea what was going on. Um, about 19, I, I had a very severe episode that lasted for months and months and months. And the way I got myself out of it was I started running and I would run every day. And that really started to help me to turn a corner. Um, so... I was always very interested in mental health and brain health, and but probably my major interest was in food. But I went on, I was studying fine art. My first degree was in fine art and I um, was only in my early 30s that I went back to study psychology because of my history with mental disorder and I was increasingly interested in just what was it that could help people or prevent, you know, these these issues and I really knew nothing about research or science or anything. But while I had my kids, I did my psychology degree part-time and then I ended up uh, doing an honours degree in medical science and epidemiology looking at depression and bone health. Uh, but it was then when I was exposed to psychiatric research because I was in a psychiatric research unit that I looked around and thought, hang on, there's no research on diet mm-hmm. and mental and brain health, not really, not any good quality stuff, nothing comprehensive where this has been directly looked at, I would really like to do this. And so I presented this idea to the head of the unit and he, bless him, was like, I don't know anything about diet, but if you think it's worth investigating, off you go. So I did. (laughs) You're amazing and here we are. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Do you think, uh, is there the, the running do you think you had an epiphany at the time or it just sort of looks like it looking back that there was the relationship between your body and inputs to your body as, as in food and running can have an impact on your mental health? Not at all. I was completely clueless. Okay. You know, I just, you know, there's so many things happening in my life at that time course, as they are yeah, in yeah. 19 and, you know, relationships and friends and movement and travel and everything else that I didn't connect that. But I did feel this strong urge to move and I did, it just became increasingly something that I needed to do. Yeah. And then I gradually came out of that episode. But then lots of other things were changing in my life. So I never connected those dots. Yeah, okay. Mm. Well, but now, of course, we know much more about how important physical movement is to mental health, mm. both for prevention and for treatment. Yeah. I know a little bit about you, Felice, because uh, my cousin is your her supervisor, uh, yeah. Jess PhD Green. PhD supervisor, yeah. PhD supervisor, and uh, and she was telling me about you. But what I thought was just just amazing is that before you started doing research, and correct me if I'm wrong, but before you started doing research on the link between nutrition and mental health, there was no research on it. Is that true? There was very little. So what there Mm -hmm. was was um, some very limited and in many cases, not all cases, pretty poorly run trials that have looked at individual nutrients like supplements, Mm -hmm. you know, um, so I don't know, folate and omega-3 fatty acids and things like that. But of course, we don't eat just those individual nutrients. And um, it's increasingly clear that taking particular substances out of food or whatever and just focusing on them is a really flawed thing because... The, I mean, food is the most complex exposure that you can think of. There, there might be now, we think, as many as 150,000 different types of phytochemicals in plant foods. Then you've got all the so, macro... So what is that? For- so phytochemicals are chemicals that are produced by plants, particularly if they're in um, healthy soils. But those phytochemicals are something that plants produce to help their survival... But because we've developed as humans, as a species, consuming plants, we've adapted to um, our body responds to those phytochemicals in all sorts of ways. And it's so complex. We haven't even begun 
to start mapping that properly. We know about eight to 10,000 of those, and that's the, the flavanols, polyphenols. People know them as antioxidants, and we know something about those. But that's just a little tiny component. And then you've got the food matrix. You've got the macronutrients, so that's your you know different sorts of carbohydrates and fats and sugars and things like that. The micronutrients, so all the vitamins and minerals, mm. all of these things. It's just so complex that the idea that you could just pick out one little bit of that and somehow you know mm. consider that an important element in and of itself is a flawed approach. It's very reductionist, and that's where the field really was um, when I came into it. And there were also quite a few what we call observational studies. So this is when you look at, you know, big groups of people in a population and you go, oh, well, you know, the people within this population who eat lots of fish um, tend to have lower levels of mood disorders, for example. But again, we don't eat just fish. So mm -hmm. they hadn't taken into account mm -hmm. the whole of diet. And when I came into psychiatry research, which was kind of accidental really, um, I was increasingly interested in, there was a new field that was opening up called psychoneuroimmunology. And basically this was just this understanding and increasing data that told us that our immune system was really important in our mental and brain health. And there was this bi-directional relationship between our immune system and our mental and brain health. And of course, our immune system is very heavily influenced by the quality of the diets we eat. Mm. We now know quite a bit more about why that might be in the gut microbiome, but we can talk about that later. There were also new data coming out of the animal research at UCLA in America that uh, neuroscientists identified towards the end of the you know 1990s, early 2000s, that there's this key region of the brain called the hippocampus that actually grows new neurons throughout life. So I remember when I was younger, the prevailing wisdom was that, you know, we were born with our full complement mm. of brain cells, our neurons, and we only lost them over the life course, which mm. is kind of depressing. Um, but then it started to become clear, and it's not 100%, there's still a little bit of controversy about it, but most people agree that this part of the brain, the hippocampus, can lay down new brain cells quite quickly. And because this is a really central part of the brain for learning and memory, but also seems to be really involved in mental health and also appetite regulation, it was really important uh, to start to study this. And then neuroscientists had been doing these animal studies where they fed animals, you know, things like blueberries, things that are very high in these antioxidants or saturated fat or sugar, and showed that it had a really obvious impact on this key region of the brain. So they were two bits of information that made me think, hang on, why are we not looking at people's diets? I mean, we look at it in every other area of medicine and health. Mm. We know that what you eat is very clearly linked to, you know, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, your risk of death. Mm. Um, but nobody was looking at it in relation to mental health. And that I think is mainly because in psychiatry, certainly over the last 100 years or so, there's been this sort of split between the mind and the body. And it's like psychiatry hasn't been particularly interested in anything that happens below the neck. Mm. But of course, we're highly integrated, very, very complex systems. And everything that happens here also affects the brain and vice versa. So why this gap was there, I think, was very puzzling to me because I'd long been interested in food as the sort of foundation of, of health because mm. really it's food we eat that powers pretty much every process in our body and brain. So no one had really looked at this as mm. a whole. And around this time, there was a lot of interesting research going on in the nutrition field where they were developing new statistical methods for looking at the whole of diet. They're certainly not perfect, but it was a much better way where you're trying to capture dietary patterns and the whole of diet, not just individual bits of diet. And so I was able with my PhD to employ those methods to look at the relationship between the habitual diets of this large group of women who were Australian, they were deemed to be very representative of the Australian female population uh, from the age of 20 right up into their 90s, of course taking into account those really important factors that can influence both diet and mental health, things like people's income, education, how much they exercise, you know, these mm. types of things, but also their body weight. Um, and then we looked at their clinical depressive and anxiety disorders. So we did clinical assessments on them. I think I did something like 
over 500 for my PhD and then mm. some more after that. Um, and then putting them together, what I saw was that women who had healthier diets, even when we took into account all those other factors, they were much less likely to have a clinical depressive or an anxiety disorder. They had unhealthier diets. There was a relationship there with more mental health problems. Um, and because this hadn't really been looked at before in psychiatry, this was my main PhD study, it was published on the front cover of the American Journal of Psychiatry, which was a really big deal. That's a big deal. And it yeah. was nominated like the most important study in psychiatry in 2010 and blah, blah, blah. Whoa. And it was really that it was just novel. Yeah. Mm. And then on the basis of that, I was able to then go and work with all of these fantastic groups all around the world who had these epidemiological data. So again, from these big population-based surveys and things, information on people's diets, their mental health, all these other factors that we needed to consider. And right across the life course from what mums eat during pregnancy, what kids eat in the first part of life, adolescence, which is in the primary age of onset for mental disorders, like half of all mental disorders start before the age of 14. And then right up to the other end of life and ageing and people often develop, um, you know, depression, for example, in the later stages of their life. There was this very clear and consistent link that diet seemed to really matter to the risk for mental disorders. And then wow. I was crazy enough as an early postdoc to go and do the first randomised control trial to say, okay, well, if someone already has a serious mental disorder, in this case um, quite a you know, moderate to severe major depressive disorder, if we intervene to help them to improve their diet, does that actually help? And I was absolutely staggered to see the results because there was a massive improvement in, on average in the people who got the dietary support and the people who, the more they changed their diet, the more they improved. Mm. And these were people often who'd been sick for many, many years. Most of them were on other forms of treatment, you know, antidepressants, psychotherapy, et cetera. But this seemed for many people to be an absolute game changer. And we saw that a full 30% of them went on to have complete remission of their depression, which is amazing. Wow. So that's a SMILES trial. And that's actually been a very famous trial, even though mm. it was certainly imperfect and it was smaller and everything else. Mm. And there's been um, several trials since then that have shown the same thing. Even in young males, which is a really difficult population yeah. to get them to change their diet, mm. Uh, in as little as three weeks in some cases. So, we, so the, the change being in their mental In their mental, mental health. health. Generally yeah. we've looked at depression and anxiety mm -hmm. and, and the field, that's where most of the information is so far, but we're certainly starting to look in other clinical disorders as well. So before you were saying that like, you know, half of all mental disorders start before the age of 14, is that's that male right. and female? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so it would make sense to me that then you would try and uh, target like younger people in terms of like how to change diet yeah. from an early age? Prevention. Mm. Yeah. What you want in mental disorders or any disorder really is to identify factors that can be modified. Mm. So, so many of the things that influence the risk for developing mental disorders are things that are really hard to modify. They're mm -hmm. things like genetics, early life trauma, life stress, poverty, disadvantage, all of these things are risk factors for developing mental disorder. Mm -hmm. Genetics, probably the most important. Um, but those are really kind of hard to change, yep. whereas diet and, you know, how much you move, these are things that can be changed, arguably. How much you um, move, oh, like move your body. Yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah. physical activity. Yeah. Um, what did you think she meant by that? Like move house. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I was like, yeah, how much you move. Obviously, if you move too many times, it can be a of an effect. <laughs> I, was like, I think that stressful. would be, yeah, it is. It's really stressful. <laughs> um, so sort of being able to focus on these things is really important, but, you know, it shouldn't be up to individuals. And mm. that's where we're, I'm really coming from with most of my conversations is about, this is about our food environment. Yeah. And the Western industrialised food system is the leading cause of illness and early death across the globe because mm. it shouldn't be up to individuals to mm. have to try Absolutely. every day to avoid those ultra-processed foods that are designed to interact with the reward systems of the brain that really prompt us to overeat and that make up in the UK and the US about 60% of average energy intake, it's a bit less in Australia, but uh, that we're increasingly seeing are super problematic. And then, of course, at the population level, almost no one is eating anywhere near enough vegetables, legumes, fibre, et cetera. 
I feel like it would be more professional of me to tease the audience and say, at the end, you're going to tell us what we should eat. But I just want to know now. Like, what, <laughs> well, I just want to know same, what, like, it, what foods would you be recommending people eat? It's it's really just the same as we know for any other, um, you know, health outcome, heart disease, diabetes, whatever, that you really try and maximise the number and the diversity of plants in your diet. And plants isn't just vegetables and uh, different types of veggies and fruit, but Things like whole grains, so, you know, oats, barley, rye, quinoa, etc. Legumes are critically important to my mind because they are just such a wonderful source of protein and fibre. So all of the different beans, you know, black mm. beans and broad beans and chickpeas and lentils, etc. Um, herbs and spices, they have a lot of those phytochemicals that I talked about mm. before. Healthy fats like, you know, extra virgin olive oil also has a lot of those Avocado. polyphenols. And it's like, you know, we would think mm. about extra virgin olive oil like medicine you know oh, it's just I such an incredible mm, yeah um but basically foods that <laughs> are just unprocessed yeah you know um i have a little bit of red meat in the form of um uh wild deer because deer in victoria are a huge environmental pest mm -hmm. and um they're really flourishing and so there are people who have the license to go out and shoot them humanely and butcher them and bring them to market and you can buy them online and in farmer's markets. But to me, that's a great option because it's environmentally sound, it's ethical. Um, I tend not to eat a lot of like chicken and fish and things like that because of environmental and ethical reasons. Mm. Um, so mainly focusing mm. on plants, and but the really key thing is avoiding those ultra-processed foods. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And so the fish interests me because I feel like I've always been told that a little bit of fish is really important for omega omega three. It is, yeah. So, what would you have to replace that? If you're it's not it's fish? a really tricky thing. I know people are talking now about algae supplements. Mm -hmm. um, it's unclear, I think, as to whether they can replace um, mm -hmm. the long chain omega three fatty acids that you get in seafood. I do have things like. Um, oysters, mussels, mm -hmm. um, things that have got those uh, omega-3 fatty acids, but they don't have a nervous system. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Technically vegan, I just realised, I found out about oysters. <laughs> yeah, technically, yeah. Mm. So a lot of vegans do eat mm. oysters and, and those bivalves, you know. Um, What's a bivalve? What's I don't know, those things that come in shells. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> like an oyster. <laughs> Sounds like something I nod to at a, at a mechanics, like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. go fix the bivalve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that bloody bivalve keeps going. But just as someone who, so I train a lot for, for running and it's mm. it's always been drilled into me. I need to have a lot of protein in my in my diet. Yeah. And I certainly notice a difference in my energy levels when I do have protein, a lot of protein when I don't. So how would you be saying I should be getting my protein in according to everything that you've studied? and Look, I think people have a lot, there's a lot of misinformation about protein. People think, oh, unless it's a, a, an animal-based protein, mm. it just doesn't cut it. But, you know, I saw, I saw a pretty and... good M&M flavoured protein powder. I don't know <laughs> if, if you think <laughs> that, that would... <laughs> would fall into the ultra-processed food <laughs> right. category. I really okay. wouldn't be going there. <laughs> it's a shame. Um, but, you know, I think that that wild venison is a, is a good option. There's a couple of companies in Victoria that mm. sell it and... Um, I think that's a that's yeah. a decent option. But again, you want to keep, you know, if you look at the ideal plate, very simply half of the plate is vegetables and, you know, plants, salad. A quarter of the plate is a whole grain of some sort and a quarter of the pr plate is a protein source. I mean, I eat a lot of tofu and tempeh. Tempeh is great, so fermented soybean. Um, nuts are also really fantastic. Like I eat nuts every day. So mm. things like cashews and walnuts and pecans and, you know, one of my team who's a dietitian said, put them in the microwave for one minute and they roast them. So they're really good. Oh. I put them on salads and on my yeah, breakfast yeah. and everything. They're really good sources of protein. So really mixing it up is important. You do, certainly don't want to be having meat seven days a week. Mm. And what we know is that the diversity of the plant foods that you take in very clearly influences the diversity of your gut microbes. And you want your gut microbes to be diverse because it means that they're resilient. It's a bit like a rainforest where it's very diverse, lots of different bacteria and fungi in the soil and, you know, all sorts of insects and different types of plants. And they all work synergistically and mutualistically. But if you have a monoculture, they're very, very vulnerable to a particular virus or mm -hmm. some pathogen coming through. So your gut microbiome is like that. The more diverse it is, with, certainly with healthy microbes, the more resilient it is. And we're increasingly seeing that, for example, 
people who have a more diverse gut microbiome will have better outcomes for cancer treatment. Um, and it's related to all sorts of things, including things like frailty and cognitive decline as we get older. Many different health outcomes are associated with the diversity of the gut microbes um, and having a very diverse diet, so not eating the same thing every day. I mean, as hunter-gatherer humans, we used to eat hundreds, thousands of different types of plant foods, Mm -hmm. and now we eat, I don't know, about five in general, you Mm -hmm. know. Our industrialised food system has made our food um, pipeline extremely uh, mono, and that is showing up in this absolute um, epidemic of immune-related disorders because 70% of your immune cells are in your gut. So your, your gut microbiome, which influences virtually every process in your body, profoundly involved in your, your immune system. So mix it up. That's the, the take home. I'm getting really caught into practical. I just want to see what my plate should look like at breakfast, lunch and yeah. dinner. <laughs> and that's what, I, that's what I'm really... <laughs> were you How many lettuce leaves? Yeah, yeah, no, no, and there's a danger with getting too hung up on it, you yeah. know. And what, what we see in the literature is that there's a very clear linear relationship between the quality of people's diets and their likelihood of having or developing depression. But that relationship with anxiety is slightly different. It's J-shaped, which means that people who are highly anxious often also have highly, really good diets. Mm. Um, And we know this also from the literature is that people who are very anxious, they actually tend to have longer lifespans because they go to the doctor and they do the prescribed Mm. amount of exercise and they eat according to what they're supposed to be eating and they do all the things and they take all the medications and they're really good, but they're very, very anxious. And what you have there is a bit of a fine line because that can very easily tip over into mm. things like orthorexia, which are eating disorders that are very common where people think, oh, my God, I ate a chip. I'm, you know, this is terrible. And, you know, mm. and it's really not like that. Your body and your microbes are incredibly resilient if you're in general just feeding them, you know, what they eat. Is there, this might be a, a dumb question because it's probably got a very complex answer, but I've always sort of wondered when you hear people talk about the microbiome and you're talking about the link to mental health from food, is the pipeline that it, how it works in your body to improve your mental health is that it's food in, microbiome better, brain better, or is there a separate mechanism that's going on as well as the microbiome? Yeah, you're asking the $64 million question. Okay. Um, this is great. For those who are interested <laughs> in the science, we've got a really great review on this in, in Molecular Psychiatry that we published a couple of years ago. No one really knows for sure because this Mm. is so complex and also there's been so few studies that have really looked at this to try and answer this question and that's something we're trying to get funding for so that we can start to answer it. But we think that probably a really important or if not the main pathway is that link that you consume food if it's got these polyphenols, phytochemicals, Mm. if it's got high fibre then it will make its way to your gut your microbes will ferment it and and produce thousands of different molecules that interact with every kind of cell pretty much in the body, Um, influences your metabolism, body weight, influences your immune system, but also seems to influence your mental health via a number of pathways. So if we think about the mechanisms that might link diet to mental health, I mentioned before the hippocampus. Now, part of that could work through the microbiome. We know that there is a link between the microbiome and the hippocampus, but we don't know if that's the only link. There might be a direct link. You've got your neurotransmitters, things like serotonin. Now, the gut microbes uh, really influence how much serotonin you have in your brain because they metabolise tryptophan from your diet and in that way, What's they. What's tryptophan? Oh, it's a it's an amino acid. It's a protein that's mm-hmm. found in a lot like something you'd have in your car as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tryptophan, yeah. stop working. <laughs> Do not have supplements, but yeah. um, you know it. It, it will if you've got a. Do you say do not have supplements? I I would be saying things that you'd be very cautious about supplements. Put it yeah. that way. I is, know this that is like multivitamins and things like that. Is that we're talking about? Look, uh, some of my colleagues would disagree vociferously with me mm-hmm. about that. Um, and there is some really interesting evidence that in some conditions, and we're here we're talking about things like ADHD, there's mm-hmm. clinical trial evidence to suggest that really high dose, good quality vitamin mineral supplements might be helpful. And that to me might point to 
uh, a problem with metabolising nutrients from food or that their microbes for some reason are not able to use what's in food properly and therefore a supplement might be useful. But often supplements can cause problems. There's clinical trial evidence to suggest that people who took multivitamin supplements, for example, had a worse outcome compared to placebo in mental health trials. Mm -hmm. I know, for example, that I'm really super sensitive to vitamin B supplements and it can actually trigger depression and anxiety in me when, and, you know, uh, there's many cases in which I think you have to be really careful. Mm -hmm. Um, when you take foods out of their environment, uh, you know, I'm talking here about their food matrix and all of those other things that go with it, Mm. you're rolling the dice. You don't know how that's going to be interacting with all these very, very complex systems in the body. So you've got to keep in mind, we evolved as hunter gatherers to consume the foods around us. And those foods are incredibly complex. As I said, tens of thousands of all sorts of macro, micronutrients, phytochemicals. Mm. Our bodies are so complex. Our brains are so complex. They're much more complex than everything we know about in the universe. We know more about, you know, far deep space and and everything out there than we do understand the brain. Mm. I mean, even psychiatric medications, in most cases, we don't really know how they work. Mm. So it's just so complicated that to take something out of such a complex system Mm. and consume it on its own, occasionally, like if obviously if someone's got a frank deficiency, then obviously Mm -hmm. that that Mm. could be really useful. But in general, I would say have the food, don't have the the supplement. It just, it always, because it, the, and this is probably what they want you to think, but uh, I think like, oh, well, if that particular food, the good thing in that is vitamin B, it's like, I'll just have the vitamin B in a pill. That's <laughs> way easier. Yeah. I'll just have that. But it makes so much sense. And of course, it's actually working with... Well, it's not just the vitamin B. I mean, any given food that has, say, for example, a whole lot of vitamin B will have all these other things yeah. as well. And they're all working together. Mm. And then they're working, interacting with all these complex systems and the microbes Mm. you're really messing with a lot of complexity there. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Um, I feel like we got, I think you were halfway through talking about the other mechanisms because there's the serotonin. And yeah, the, there's yeah, the neurotransmitters, there's and the then, hippocampus, there's yeah. the mitochondria, yeah. you know, the, these little engines in your cells that produce energy and that we increasingly think are involved in bipolar disorder and those sorts of things. Uh, there's inflammation and oxidative stress, which is your immune system and what happens when you have too many reactive oxygen Mm. species. They're sort of related. There's epigenetics, which we're really only just starting to understand, but probably are extremely important, certainly in any aspect of health, so presumably also mental health. We don't really know a lot about it yet, but the foods you eat or anything in your environment influences how your genes are turned on and off. Mm. So we come with our set of genes, but whether or not they're active and what they do, epigenetics, which is like the 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 bits that play the keyboard of your genes, yeah, that is kind of determining whether or not they're switched on or off, yeah. and you know what they do. So uh, the environment, including diet, influences those epigenetic processes. But we're very much in our early stages of understanding that. Um, your stress response system, so your HPA axis, it's called hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, um, the the gut microbes and the gut brain axis are yeah. very much part of that. But then the gut microbes themselves, they actually interact with all of those other things. Okay. They influence gene expression. They're closely involved in our immune system. They influence our neurotransmitter levels. They produce hosts of neurotransmitters themselves. Even that remedy kombucha I was drinking when I came in this morning would have neurotransmitters in it <laughs> that had been produced by the bugs that are in that drink. Wow. Now, we don't know if they interact directly with the brain. We're still very much trying to figure that out because, again, it's complicated and you've got the blood-brain barrier that stops a lot of things. So when people say, oh, you know, your gut bugs produce serotonin, well, yes, they might, but they're probably not directly influencing your brain serotonin and mm. they're interacting with other things. But the the gut microbes, as I said, influence how much serotonin is produced for the brain by influencing the metabolism of tryptophan. Um, Mitochondrial function, increasingly understood to be important and increasingly we're seeing that the gut microbes are involved in that. So what's that? The 
the, the engine of the cell? Yeah, that's the little energy mm. engine mm. of the cell. Very good. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so, I just yeah, copied well what she said before. <laughs> 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 um, but it's increasingly clear that diet influences all of those pathways. All of those are involved in mental and brain health. And the gut microbiota seems to be a really central thing that connects them all. And it's also a really concrete and easy way for people to think about food. It's like, okay, food goes in, it goes down. Hopefully, if it's the right type of food, it makes its way to the large bowel, the the gut. Mm. And then the bacteria and not just bacteria, like there are, you know, viruses and fungi and parasites and all sorts of things all working together. Um, But the bacteria we know a bit about and they break down the food, produce these thousands of different molecules that influence all those systems that we just discussed. And in that way, mental and brain health, uh, as far as we know so far, is affected. What's really interesting too, though, is that we've just recently seen a new study. I don't even know if it's been officially published yet, but it was on a what we call a preprint. There's this really important highway between the gut and the brain called the vagus nerve, and we've known about that forever. So when mm. people talk about the gut-brain axis, that's actually what they're talking about, this you know major highway of nerves and hormones and everything that allows the brain and the gut to speak to each other in a bi-directional way. Most of the signals are going from the gut to the brain, but about 10% go from the brain to the gut. That vagus nerve is like a highway. And in a recent really interesting study from the US, they showed that in animals, and again, it's very difficult to do neuroscience without using animals because you can't chop people's heads off and have a look at what's happening no, inside. No. <laughs> Please don't do that. that. <laughs> um, They showed that then when there was pathogenic or unhealthy bacteria in the gut of the animal, it was also present in the brain and in the vagus nerve. And then when they cut, well, they can only cut half of the vagus nerve without killing the animal. When they did that, most of that pathogenic bacteria in the brain was no longer evident. So what it's saying is that there seems to be potentially a direct route between the, the bacteria in your gut and your brain via the vagus nerve. It's actually using it like a highway. So what Mm. you put in your gut will directly affect what's going on in your brain. This is what this research suggests, that um, what you eat influences the microbes that are in your gut. And it's not just what you eat and your that direct link to your gut, but we're increasingly understanding that the microbes that maybe we breathe in and that are in our lungs, the microbes in our mouth, that we're swallowing all the time, they're all making their way to the gut. But then there's this direct link via the vagus nerve to the brain. Mm. And there's an increasing amount of research that's focusing on how maybe pathogenic microbes in the brain, viruses and bacteria might be influencing Alzheimer's disease. Wow. So it's super, super interesting. But for people trying to get their head around why what they eat might be linked to their mental and brain health, that's probably the most concrete uh, way of mm. thinking about it. So without, without wanting to be like too fear or anything like that, like we don't, we don't do that, but um, on the flip side, and this is not to shame anyone or to, you know, judge, mm. um, but what are the effects on your mental health if you're consistently eating like... Heavily processed food. Heavily yeah. processed food, yeah. Well, what we know from, again, the observational literature is if you look at people who eat a lot of these types of ultra-processed foods, uh, and again, taking into account all those important things like, you know, their income and education and body weight and... And the fact that your kids won't eat anything else. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, (laughs) They have an increased risk of developing depression. We know that, as well as an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and all sorts of other things and shorter lifespans. Incre- increased by how much do we know? Uh, in the case of depression, on average, it's about 20 odd percent. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. yeah. But there's few experimental studies because it's kind of difficult getting, well, A, it's difficult getting funding, but B, it's really hard to get ethics approval to give a whole lot of junk food to people and see mm-hmm. what happens to their mental health. But that has been looked at. So colleagues of ours up in Sydney did two really important studies where they got young, healthy um, uh, university students who generally ate a pretty healthy diet and they were in the healthy weight range, you know, healthy, I say in inverted commas, but, you know, that BMI range that's considered to be optimal. Um, 
and they put them on, in the first case, they just gave them a, a high saturated fat, high sugar breakfast for four days in a row and they had a control group. Can, sorry, can you give an example of what that would be? Uh, it was like a milkshake and a toasty, like with, you know, mm. ham cheese. I don't know exactly what was in it, mm. but lots of Which, saturated Which incidentally fat. is what I had every day when I went to uni. So that's... <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so lots of fat, lots of sugar, and then they had a, a control condition who got sort of a milkshake and a toasty, but it wasn't an unhealthy version like that. And over four days, just four days, they did cognitive testing on them. Now, remember that the hippocampus, this key region of the brain, is very plastic. It grows and shrinks. So it grows new neurons, but it can also lose neurons and lose size. And uh, they did cognitive tests that looked at the types of memory tasks that are linked to the hippocampus. And they showed that in just four days, there was a negative impact on cognition in Mm. these young people who got that, just the breakfast. And then they expanded it and they did a, a week and it wasn't just breakfast. It was like, here's some vouchers, go and eat at Macca's and blah, blah, blah. And they again saw the same impact. They followed them up, uh, I think, three months later and found that they'd reverted. They went back to baseline because they'd reverted back to their healthier diet. But that suggests that you can um, have a negative impact on cognition, memory, everything else uh, pretty quickly by eating junk food. Now, I say junk food. Those foods weren't necessarily ultra-processed. And this is one of the key discussions in the field and there's a lot of contention, which is very much being fed by big big industry. Is it just the salt, sugar, fat in ultra-processed foods that's the problem or is there something else about the processing that's problematic in and of itself? As far as preservatives and things like that? Not or... just preservatives. Or there's so many things. If you yeah. think in, in ultra-processed foods, there's often preservatives. There's emulsifiers. Now, in animal studies we see that emulsifiers can affect the lining of the gut. So a healthy gut has this nice thick mucus layer that kind of protects, um, it keeps whatever's in the gut in the gut and stops it getting out into the bloodstream. Many people have heard of this leaky gut idea. Mm. But it is actually a thing where the the, the tight junctions are, are wider and contents of uh, the gut, including bacteria that can promote inflammation, so that's detriment to the immune system uh, and all sorts of things can escape into the bloodstream and the body mounts this immune response to them. It does look like there might be an impact directly on the brain and that it also might be a pathway by which the brain, blood-brain barrier becomes more leaky as well, which would allow things to get into the brain that potentially are not great. But all of this is very early research being done in animals. But we know that emulsifiers, which are just everywhere in processed foods, they actually um, affect that mucus lining of the gut. And in animal studies, they promote this leaky gut. Mm. Um, Artificial sugars also from the animal studies suggest that they have a problematic impact on the gut. Um, But there was a key study published a couple of years ago by one of the real gurus in nutrition research internationally. So Kevin Hall's at NIH in Washington, D.C., And they have this incredible facility where they can basically get people and lock them up voluntarily, (laughs) obviously. (laughs) Incredible. (laughs) And feed them and study them like, you know, guinea pigs for a few weeks. And he was very interested in and quite sceptical of this idea that there's something specific about ultra-processed foods that makes them problematic, apart from their fat, sugar, salt content. And so he designed a study where people came in and um, it was a crossover study. So people were split into two groups and one group got um, a food and a diet, a menu every day that wasn't ultra processed. So it was things like pasta with tomato sauce and bread and a, a snack and things like that, drinks that weren't ultra processed, but they weren't particularly healthy. They mm. were just your standard, you know, um, food that people would consider quite common. And then the other group got the same thing, like pasta or a bit of pizza or drinks or snacks or whatever that were also, they were kind of matched energy-wise, more or less, as much as they could be matched in terms of the macro and micronutrients. Because often on you'll see on ultra-processed foods, they'll say, it's got vitamins and mm-hmm. it's got minerals, it's got fibre, but they're kind of added back in. Mm. And... Um, People rated both diets as equally palatable, which means that they they thought both of them were equally yummy. Mm. 
And then people were swapped over uh, over a period of time. And what he found was that when people were having the ultra processed version of the diet, oh, so one of those one of those meals was an ultra like packaged pasta. That's and things right, like that. packaged okay. pastas, mm. packaged pizzas, things mm-hmm. that have got an ultra processed food is where it originally started off as food, but it was just completely pulled apart and then reconstituted for shelf life with all sorts of other stuff in it to make it more appealing. Okay, not just shelf life, but also more appealing. That as so well. Yeah, yeah, okay. Cool. When people were on the ultra-processed version, they ate 500 calories a day more on average, even though they'd rated both diets as being equally mm. appealing. Satisfying. Mm. They ate more. There's something about, we think, something about the ultra-processed foods that's bypassing the body's natural, very complex systems of appetite regulation, and this makes sense in relation to the gut microbes, mm. Because the gut microbes are interpreting this food and they're going, oh, that's not food. Mm. You know, that's not food as I recognised it, that I have evolved symbiotically Mm. with this organism, the human, over millennia. What what the hell is this? You know, and that because Mm. they influence all of these complex systems and it looks like appetite, but they also influence the hippocampus, which is also involved in satiety, which is that feeling of fullness. And that's what the, the research studies in Sydney with the young people from university also showed, is that people were more hungry. It seemed to um, mm. influence their satiety. Mm. So I did intermittent fasting for it was about a year I did it for. And so my last meal was around about 7 o'clock at night. And if I had a meal that we have discussed today to be a healthy choice, so salad, small amount of red meat, and intermittent fasting, for those who don't know, is like you don't eat for how many hours a day? It was 16. Uh, sorry, I would have a 16-hour fasting yeah. break yeah, overnight. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so oh, let's say, I mean, if I ate it, um, if I ate at 6 o'clock at night, I wouldn't eat until um, 10. 10, 10 the next day. Yeah. So um, if I ate salad and um, had a small bit of red meat, I wouldn't be hungry the next morning. But if I had... A, a burger, or for example, when we go on our tour after we do our live shows, we have a tradition of having McDonald's oh, after. I was hoping you wouldn't oh, tell about that. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Throw us under the bus. <laughs> Thanks for, <laughs> for dobbing. <laughs> if, if we had McDonald's, we did have that tradition. Would you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, often I try and get the wrap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> doing my but, best. And so, if we're McDonald's the night before, and much more food would go in than the salad and a bit of room, yeah. I would be so hungry the next morning. Oh yeah. And I couldn't believe, and that to me was just a sign of that. That told me everything I needed to know. Yeah. Not, I'm not, I'm not just, I'm not just having a go at McDonald's here. It was, if I had, you know, a sausage roll for dinner, if it was processed, I would be starving the next morning, and it yeah. was so difficult. Well, that's what the emerging data literature suggests is going on: is that it's affecting the satiety signalling in the body differently. Um, and we think the hippocampus is probably involved because the hippocampus is affected by what you eat. It's affected by your microbes. And it um, seems to play a role in satiety and appetite regulation. So, yeah, you will eat more. And, of course, this is what big food wants. So all of those big companies, Unilever and PepsiCo and Nestle, et cetera, et cetera, that make these ultra, ultra processed foods, hey, they're going to maximise their profits if you go back for more and more and more. Do you th- do you think that within those companies and without wanting um, <laughs> to become a conspiracy theorist or anything, but do you think within those companies they know what they're doing to make that happen to their foods? It's a really good question. I think, you know, these companies are massive. They're, they're the largest companies in the world in many cases, mm. um, certainly in that, you know, top, I don't know, 10 or something. Um I've worked with them. I'm on the steering committee for the World Economic Forum's New Frontiers and in Nutrition Initiative, which has, you know, these people. I think there's, it's not like people are going, ha, 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 you know, mm. we're going to, you know, there may be people who do that. <laughs> mm. um, but there's also a sort of a paradigm. Like if you're in the US and, you know, I go there for work, it's been several generations now. Uh, of a completely distorted food system Mm. such that people don't actually see that what they're consuming is ultra-processed food. They just think it's food. Yeah. You know, I was invited to this sort of small round table set of workshops at the the equivalent to the EPA over in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. So in the US, looking at environmental, things in the environment that have an effect on mental and brain health. 
So there's 10 of us or so in the room, scientists from all over the world. Many of them were focusing on things like air pollution that we know has an impact on the developing brain um, and other environmental toxins and things like that. And I sort of got up and presented the data and I said, well, based on the data so far, the most problematic exposure is Western industrialised foods. And they were just kind of stunned because they're all sitting there with their McDonald's. healthy, <laughs> well, no, not, not McDonald's, but things that are supposedly healthy, like their Diet Cokes and yeah. their, you know, high protein snack that's in a, in a package and their, um, you know, grain based chips and things mm. that they think are healthy because on the packet it says it's high protein or it's high fibre or it's low this or low that. And to them it's like, but that's food, that's healthy for me because they don't recognise anymore because there's been several generations now that that isn't food and that that's abnormal. Is money generally speaking an issue? Because like I, I think I naturally you do hear that it's if you are in a lower socioeconomic group mm. and particularly at the moment where it's like people are really struggling with money, um, it, I can absolutely understand if people would hear this and go like, um, um, I've got other things to worry about other than like yeah, me changing my diet. Absolutely. Um, and it's a huge issue, particularly in places like the US where you get these food deserts mm. and food swamps and it's very difficult to access whole healthy food and it's very expensive. Yeah. Um, but we did this, we've done it with two trials now, detailed economic evaluation. So in the SMILES trial, where we help people to change their diet from one that was pretty heavy on the, the junk food in inverted commas and, and low on vegetables, fruits, legumes, fish, olive oil, et cetera, et cetera. And we helped them to improve their diet. We did a very, very detailed cost analysis. So we had health economists working on it where um, we looked at the Everything that people were eating, that they, they had detailed food diaries when they came into the study, costed every single item, costed every single item that we were recommending that they consume. And we were saying things like frozen vegetables, fantastic, tinned and dried legumes, brilliant, tin fish, absolutely fine, you know, like mm. stuff that is not expensive. Our diet was actually significantly cheaper. Fascinating. So you can eat cheaply. <laughs> Um, and even in places where, say, for example, people might not um, be able to even access a supermarket where they have fresh food because they don't have a car. But if you've got a freezer, frozen vegetables, fantastic. As I said, dried beans and tin beans, they're so cheap. And mm. I mean, they're the basis of my diet. You can eat so cheaply if you're eating a mm. sort of mainly plant-based diet. So um, it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be organic. I mean, ideally, it's not just organic, but from regen farms. But that's really getting to the nice to have top of things when you consider that only about 5% of, of adults in Australia eat even the basics mm. of the dietary guidelines. Less than 1% of young people, like toddlers in Australia, consume the recommended amount of fibreful foods, so vegetables, legumes. Everybody's eating badly, not just poor people, not just people who don't have an education, everyone. Mm. Yeah. There's so many things I want to ask. <laughs> um, Which what, croissant can I have? <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that I find quite empowering about looking at this through a mental health lens is that every time I think about what I eat under the traditional um, health lens of like causing diabetes or Heart cancers disease. or heart disease. Mm -hmm. It's such a prolonged outcome. Yeah. Whereas I feel like mental health is such a powerful way to talk about this because you feel it straight away. 100%. And this is what our data show as well, that even young men who mm. are just traditionally really resistant to health messaging, you know, tradies, if you like, will change their diet. No problem at all. If you tell them it's going to influence their mental and brain health, their ability to think, learn, remember, wow. their mental health. And you experience it so quickly. And you experience it so quickly. And then men, men do respond to that, you're saying? Yeah, this is what we've seen Whoa. in um, one of the four trials that have been done. It was done in young men and mm. um, they did change their diet and they did show a profound benefit. So is then is there, because it's, you know, we sh I'm sure there's never enough funding for research for no. what you do. <laughs> Especially not in Australia. Yeah, but is there... Is there enough then, is it a marketing thing then as much as it is 
a research thing. Well, it's thing. one of the reasons that I'm always out on the hustings doing a lot of media and everything mm. because the more people understand this, the more they go, oh, it's like a light bulb moment yeah. where they go, okay, because people, you know, humans are terrible at thinking about future consequences. Mm. I mean, look at what's happening with climate change. If it's something that, oh, maybe in the future I might have a heart attack, it's not going to do anything. And yeah. also our whole messaging for decades has been around bloody obesity and body size. Mm. It's just ridiculous. I mean, it's a really stigmatising thing to focus on. It's really difficult to change. People's genes play a major role in their body size. And if they're in an environment where they can have untrammeled access to food, they're generally going to reach a large body size if their genetics inc are inclined that way. Once you've got a larger body size, it's very difficult to reverse that. So people just give up and they go, oh, God, I've tried every diet in the book. I might as well just eat the chips. And then they, they're binging too. They're going, next week I'm going to be good, but this weekend I'll do this because it's all in the future. Mm. But once they understand, and this is what our research tells us and the emerging research in the area overall, is that once people understand that it affects their mental and brain health, and then that happens pretty quickly, they really respond and they do find that very empowering because it's something that they can do for themselves. Yeah. So my husband and I wrote a book called There's a Zoo in My Poo and it's for kids Yeah. because kids are really cluey, mm. you know. So I, I was fortunate enough to lead the first study that looked at that diet hippocampus link in humans. So as I said, there'd been lots of work that had been done in animals, but I was working with a team up at the ANU in Canberra We'd already shown in this big cohort of people that um, people who had a healthier diet were less likely to develop depression in older age. It's in older age your hippocampus starts to shrink. It's when you start to lose your keys and forget your grandkids' names and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, so we looked, they, there was a subgroup of about 250 of these older adults who we had MRI data on. And even when we took into account not just depression but very detailed measures of their socioeconomic status, life events, all sorts of things that might affect the hippocampus, we saw that there was a very strong relationship between the quality of their diets and the size of their hippocampus. People who had better quality diets had much larger hippocampus. They were re it was a really pronounced relationship. Mm. That's since been shown in another much couple of much larger studies. So we think what is true in, in animals is true in humans. Now, when people, everyone's so worried about getting dementia, obviously. Everybody really wants their kids to be able to function well at school and learn and remember. Everyone wants their brains to work well and not to have brain fog. If we know, if people understand that the quality of what they're eating is going to influence the size and the functioning of their hippocampus pretty fast, that is very powerful. It's powerful knowledge. I, I find myself feeling that there's a real inherent tragedy in some of the in something that you brought up, and it's a bit of an elephant in the room because our in our family we had an eating disorder enter mm. our house for quite a, a long time. I don't know if that's the right way to phrase it or disordered eating, um, and in the form of anorexia. Yeah. Um, I just feel so sorry for people who find themselves in that situation because it seems that the disordered eating is a self-fulfilling prophecy that would enhance the intensity of the mental illness. Yeah, it does. That then makes it harder and harder and harder to break out of that cycle. It's very complex, the eating disorder, um, neurophysiology, what's mm. going on in the brain. And I'm certainly not an expert, although we have done some work in our unit looking at the gut microbes in anorexia because we think that they're definitely involved in some way. Like if mm. you take, um, not you, but mm. somebody, <laughs> scientists, take a poo from a child with um, severe malnutrition and they can actually transplant and cause malnutrition in an animal. Mm. Um, wow. when, when people go into hospital for refeeding, if they have anorexia, uh, they're often fed foods that we think will probably not be the greatest for the um, microbes, mm. which may exacerbate some aspects of their psychiatry. But very early days, we don't know for sure. But more broadly speaking, it's something that we are critically aware of when we talk about diet quality and mental health. The mental disorder thing is such an issue because people can, and it goes back to what I was talking about before with anxiety, they can get really hung up on the details and they go, oh my God, I didn't eat my 10 different types of veggies today. Ah, you know, I'm going to mm. be unwell. It's really, the evidence does not support that in any way, shape or form. 
the critical thing is in every bit of research that we and others have done, body weight just is not involved. So many people will assume too that the quality of people's diets affects their body weight, which affects their mental health. Now, there's no doubt that what you eat can have an influence on your body size and weight. And on average, people who eat a less healthy diet will have a larger body size, but it's not always true. And there's no doubt that there's a bi-directional relationship between body weight and things like depression. When people are depressed, they have more of these stress hormones, which tend to make you put on more weight around your stomach. More weight around your stomach can be quite pro-inflammatory. Mm. And we think these inflammatory molecules can prompt depression. So there's this bi-directional relationship mm. there. But if you look at the observational research, so big populations, what people eat, their mental health, we take into account their body weight and we see no matter what the body weight is, that relationship exists. It doesn't work mm. through body weight. So the body weight by itself is almost a, it's a meaningless figure. Yeah, it, well, it, in this As context, an isolated thing in, in terms of, of diet and mental health, it's not the pathway yeah, by okay. which diet is influencing mental right. health, okay. it looks like, because in our SMILES trial, the average body mass index of people coming into the trial was about 30, so they were in the overweight obese category. Um, and that didn't change. The diet we were advocating was not a weight loss diet by any means. So people's body weight stayed pretty stable, but still they experienced a massive improvement in their mental health. I think that I think wow. that's just so important to yeah. make a point of because it, it, I always sort of like, tense up and get worried when we're talking about weight and body weight because yeah. it is such a we subjective just thing. ignore it, you know, yeah. like honestly, the and as, as growing up as a female and particularly in places like Australia, such a sexist culture and during the 70s and everything else, I mean, myself and my peers are all being so inculcated into this thing about, oh my God, you must be thin and, you know, and it's really been around advertisers driving insecurity to sell more stuff and, mm. you know, we know all the reasons why that happens doesn't stop it affecting your, your mm. internal view of yourself. But for younger cohorts coming up, I'm starting to see much more acceptance of different shapes and diversity and everything else and a recognition of how they've been played mm. and what absolute crap this is, which is fantastic. But if people have a healthy diet and they've got, you know, some physical activity that they enjoy and they've got decent sleep happening... Their body size is kind of irrelevant. I mean, you know, it's not about that. It also feels like if you've got those that structure in place of a healthy diet and sleep and movement, it, you would be better placed to fight against, in your own head, the yeah. pressures of yeah. uh, be skinny or be all that kind of stuff. You're better placed to battle that. <laughs> That's on right. An I mean, basis. I mean, this whole internal thing every day of oh my god, I've eaten too much and mm. too many calories, and all oh, that meal was a bit too big, or I shouldn't have had that. I mean, what a waste of time! Mm. What a waste of mental energy! If you're feeding yourself beautiful, nourishing food, and that's full of all those phytochemicals, certainly if you're lucky enough to have access to you know organic regenerative farms that are just full of all the good microbes and everything else, you've extra virgin olive oil, you know, things that are full of fibre and lots of different types of fibre and all of those things, you're nurturing your body, mm. you're nurturing your mind, you're nurturing your brain, you're nurturing your joy. It's just your body weight. Just forget about it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Well said. Yeah. Mm. Well said. Uh, I'd love to ask you about alcohol. It's such, it's so embedded in our culture here in Australia that it's mm. alcohol with meals at night and then all celebrations. It's such a big part of the Australian mm. identity. And that's not, I mean, every country claims that. It's like the, the UK, <laughs> yeah. look, it's a big part of, so it's a big part of, you know, it's all over the bloody world. Bloody Irish heritage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Blame them, my, <laughs> my Irish colleagues. Oh, God, it's my weak spot and my mm. bugbear as well. I find it very difficult to manage my relationship with alcohol. I mean, it's certainly gotten a lot better over the last 20 years or so, but... It is so uh, pervasive. It's so everywhere you go, like it's impossible to avoid and it's really not good. Alcohol is a neurotoxin and we know from studies uh, that I've discussed around looking at the hip diet and the hippocampus, there's been three studies done and one of those sort of picked apart the aspects of diet that most closely related to hippocampal size, alcohol was the big one. 
Uh, the good news is it looks like um, if you stop drinking or dramatically reduce that you can fix that aspect of your brain potentially, but we don't really know for sure. Binge drinking, uh, which is, you know, very common, that has a detrimental impact on the gut microbes and the gut lining, which is as you would expect. On the other hand, small amounts of red wine, and in the Mediterranean, I mean, ideally, certainly as part of a traditional Mediterranean diet, which doesn't really exist that much anymore, but tiny little amounts, like we're talking 100 mils this much with a meal, is good. It reduces stress, which is good for your microbes, good for your mental health. There are polyphenols and things in red wine. So it may be that a little bit is okay from your gut point of view, but from things like cancer, there's no safe level of consumption. And I think, you know, to my mind, I've had breast cancer twice. I've had my breasts removed, awful experience, chemo, everything else. And I really directly attribute that to my younger years. My husband was in a band and, you know, mm. like alcohol was such a big part of our mm. lives. Um, and that thing of, you know, in the evening you get home, you open the bottle of wine because that just provides that instant stress relief and enjoyment and reward and everything else, I don't have any doubt that that was a ma major contributor to mm. my breast cancer and that's why I really try and limit alcohol now. Um, so in short, really fun uh, but really, really not good for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <It's laughs> Very um... hard to avoid though. There's a lot of fantastic non-alcoholic drinks now that yeah. are, I find really helpful, particularly the beers. You know, mm -hmm. some of the mm -hmm. beers are just great. So those beers, so like, obviously that is an, that's a processed Product, I imagine. Those uh, I don't know that it would fall it? into the category of ultra ah. processed. So um, that would actually be not a bad. I actually wonder whether they've got those fermentation products mm. a bit similar to kombucha. I don't mm. know if anyone's actually looked at that, but it makes yeah. sense to me that they would. Yeah, yeah, because because yeah, you know, I mean, even just last night, I went to the pub and I had like two beers, and and I and then I remember thinking afterwards, I was like. I probably didn't need to have like those beers. It's just such a thing of like, well, I'm at the pub. Yeah. It's yeah. like I want it's one. It's a social thing yeah. and a gathering. But then I did think afterwards, like what if I had the non-alcoholic ones, it mm. probably would have had the exact same impact on like my sense of like yeah. being at the pub. We yeah. went to the same pub last night and we didn't see each yeah, other. Yeah, we didn't see each other. <laughs> and I had two non-alcoholic beers just ah, to, just did to you show you enjoy off. yourself yeah. as much as you oh. lived my dream life. I, I, I had a wonderful time. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I think that we actually have to just be a bit realistic about the fact that, again, industry promotes alcohol consumption as it, you know, goes hand in hand with family occasions, mm. with social occasions, with celebrations, commiserations. Industry is making a huge huge amount of money out of a hell of a lot of misery and a detriment to our health, uh, to cancer, to our brain, to our gut. Um, so as much fun as it is, and, you know, kills me to say this because I really love wine, but you just can't kind of get away with it. And, mm. you know, I drank a lot when I was young because I had severe anxiety, depression. It would give me a break from that. Yeah. You know, and it's uh, so wonderful to just go, oh, thank God, and just lose yourself in mm. that. But then you're so much worse the next day and mm. you don't even realise until you stop just how miserable it can make you if you're inclined to having depression, anxiety. Yeah. It only occurred to me recently when I've really, from having kids and getting a bit older and just having a lot more on, I couldn't really afford to be feel hungover. Yeah. My mental conversation because I just find it so difficult to not have that you know, spritz or whatever, you know, and on beautiful, mm. warm Melbourne night and mm. you're out and everything else. But is to switch it around, not that this is really bad for my health or my gut or my brain, but I'm going to get a benefit if I don't have it. Mm. I'm going to feel so much better. I love that feeling in the morning. You wake up with energy and clear head and the difference is massive. And yeah. it's only when you stop that you realise what a difference What you're missing is. out on. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Can I, can I ask about fermented foods? The fermented stuff is really interesting. If you can get those in. Mm, that was so, after Tim Spector was on yeah, the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I started eating that every day. So sauerkraut, um, kimchi, but, you know, there's lots of other sorts of fermented foods. There's like tempeh and miso and um, obviously kefir and kombucha and things like that. But there was a really fascinating study published a couple of years ago. And, you know, it was only a small study. It certainly needs to be uh, expanded upon. I'm sure that's happening now. But. You know, in the US, you've got what we call a SAD, the standard American diet. It's absolutely 
shitful. Like it could not be worse. Mm. It's so heavily on uh, ultra-processed foods, so low in fibre, so low in every macro, micronutrient. I mean, it's not surprising that this generation has a shorter lifespan than the one before, and it's almost like they're eating their way out of existence. Um, But people recommend that to improve your microbiome diversity and reduce inflammation, which is a marker of immune function, you should increase fibre in the diet. So basically this study wanted to actually test head-to-head what a, what a good strategy might be for improving diversity of the microbiome and reducing inflammation. And so one group got this high-fibre diet where they were gradually over a period of, I think, three weeks encouraged to eat more and more fibrous foods, more fibre in their diet. And the other group got a fermented foods diet. So they over three weeks, again, they um, gradually increased their consumption of fermented foods such that they were having... Six serves a day, but they're tiny. So if you say you were having three three meals a day, you were having a fermented food of some sort. So whether it was a yogurt, kefir, you know, sauerkraut, kimchi, those sorts of things. And at the end of the study, they showed that the people who had the high fermented foods diet, they increased their microbiome diversity and they reduced inflammation. So yay, that's great. In the high fibre group, quite a different set of outcomes. Some people did really well, increased diversity, reduced inflammation. Others did really badly and ended up with horrible stomach aches and more inflammation. And they thought, why would this be? And I thought, well, actually, if they've got a really like a microbiome like a desert, Mm. which so many do in the US, and you see this in the data that when people immigrate from uh, areas where there's much more, a much better food culture into the US, their microbiome becomes less and less diverse and they get sicker and sicker. Maybe if they don't have the microbes that can break down all these different types of fibre, they're not going to do so well and they're going to feel pretty terrible. So they looked and they saw undigested fibre in their stool. So it's saying that it was the people who had the low level of diversity to start with, they couldn't quite cope with adding Mm. fibre back in because they just didn't have the microbes that were able to to break it down. You have to like build it back up. Yeah, and how you do that is unclear at this stage. The Mm -hmm. research hasn't been done. I would really love to get funding to do this because I've got a lot of really great dietitian researchers in my team. I suspect that if it's done gradually with fermented foods, so with the fermented foods, they didn't see increases in microbes that were directly in those fermented foods. So you Mm -hmm. might get a, you know, a kombucha or something and go, oh, it's got these particular bacteria, drink the kombucha, Let's look in the stool and see if those microbes exist there. Mm. What seems to happen is fermented food seems to um, provide a good environment for the microbes that might be living in minuscule numbers in your gut to sort of flourish. Mm -hmm. And it might be, and we don't know, it's not yet tested, but to increase uh, the fibre gradually in your diet for those people who say, when I cut out foods and went on to a carnival diet, I felt so much better. Well, it's like, yeah, because your microbes are not able to break down the fibre, so you're getting stomach aches, Mm. IBS, whatever, to gradually increase fibre with fermented foods. Mm. Uh, I think that that might be what comes out of the literature over time. But it is super fascinating because from the animal studies, after four generations of low fibre diets, in animals, they've lost so much diversity that even when fibre is reintroduced, they can't get it back. The only way they can get back the diversity is through faecal microbial transplants, poo transplants. Okay. Gosh. I feel like I experienced a microcosm of what you're talking about a few weeks ago because I got gastro. Oh, yuck. Awful. It was about the sickest I've ever felt in my life, apart from a food poisoning incident in Bangladesh, which was one step worse. But this was um, (laughs) as, as bad as I felt. But I had this, and I get really, whenever I get sick, I get really depressed pretty quickly. It really yeah. hits me hard. Because you is... often get this inflammation and that we think that ah. these pro-inflammatory molecules, these cytokines actually promote depression. Right. Mm. I've, I've Very always wondered why that was the case. Mm. But then I had this thing of like, all right, well, I want to, I can I gradually feel like I could probably start eating here. And in the back of my head, I'm like, well, the advice is eat, you know, White, bit of white bread, yeah. like really plain foods that your stomach can handle when you're coming back from it. And I was just thinking, well, I'm just going to feel crap <laughs> because of what I'm starting to learn about this stuff. It's just going to prolong my feeling of depression. Like when can I start to get back into eating more complex foods 
coming out of gastro. And it just feel, feels like that experience is like a microcosm of what you're talking about yeah, on a grand yeah. scale. Of and those with... big disturbances to the gut, like mm. the course of antibiotics, severe gastro, something like that, you really do want to kind of try to replenish that microdiversity and, mm. and really support your gut. So I, you know, not just fibrous foods, but the fermented foods mm. are really Absolutely. important. I think it's really interesting. You know, my my cousin um, was unexpectedly, she was very healthy, um, fit person, but in her early 60s was diagnosed uh, quite unexpectedly with advanced ovarian cancer. And they found that it had spread to her bowel and everything else. It was really bad. And she wasn't expected to live and she was super sick. Anyway, they took her bowel, you know, so she's got like a colostomy bag, whatever. And she is still alive, healthy, kicking years later. But when she was going through chemo, um, she said to me, what can I do to improve my chances of responding to the chemo? And I said, well, everything we know about the gut, the gut microbiome, everything suggests that you should be making sure that you have these diverse high fiber foods and things. It's like, oh, hang on, you don't have a gut. Mm. What about fermented foods, things that you consume that have got these fermentation products in them? So what's going on in the gut kind of in a simpler form happens in the jar or the bottle. You provide the microbes with a substrate, they they ferment them, and all of those, well, a lot of those molecules are produced. So if you're just having fermented foods and, um, you know, something that for her it would be drinking, like a kombucha type thing, you're still getting uh, these fermentation products. System. And so as commonly happens with chemo, you have to, and I've had chemo, you have to, they check your um, neutrophils, this marker of immune function, before they give you each next dose because you really have to have a, a happy immune system to be able to cope with it. And what often happens is that people's immune function gets worse over the course of chemo and that delays their chemo treatment, which really has implications for their outcomes. And this is what was happening to her. And then I'd suggested this, you know, consuming fermented foods and blah, blah. And she did that. And when she went back to the, to the oncologist a couple of weeks later to have her neutrophils checked, they said, oh, my God, they're fantastic. What did you do? Mm. And she said, well, this is what I've done. And they said, oh, yes, well, that would make sense based on what we know so far. And she said, but nobody told me this. Mm. And they said, well, that's not. It's because we don't have enough evidence Evidence to put them into the clinical guidelines. And this is a big issue everywhere. Um, The work that we've done has influenced now the clinical practice guidelines of the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatry in Australia. First time anywhere in the world where they've put what is essentially lifestyle medicine as the foundation of treatment. So lifestyle medicine being food, essentially? Not just food, food physical activity, okay. sleep and smoking and other substance cessation. So those, you know, that foundation. And they've said it's foundational. It's essentially non-negotiable. You've got to do this because it doesn't mean you do that instead of other treatments, but it's mm. like that. You've got to get That's that right. Yeah. So, wait, so it's food, sleep, activity. Or physical or activity, smoking, cessation and other substances. Obviously that would include excessive alcohol consumption. Because they're finally going, oh, actually, all of these things are necessary for any organism to to function well. Mm. And if we get that right, then other treatments we give them are going to work better as well. Certainly in cancer, we see that, for example, the really interesting thing is in these new immunotherapies. Now, they're showing miraculous results, just mind-blowing, really, how much the whole cancer treatment field is being transformed by immunotherapy. But only about 40% of people on average respond to immunotherapy. So there's actually studies underway at the moment where they're taking poo transplants from people who have responded and putting them to people who haven't responded to see if they can improve their outcomes. But on the other hand, people who have a course of antibiotics within a month or two of immunotherapy are twice as likely to die. Your gut is central. If you want to survive cancer, you've got to be looking after the health and diversity of your gut. Mm. Our food and mood uh, centre at Deakin is unique in the world. It's the only research institute in the world that looks at nutritional psychiatry across the spectrum. We look everything from mechanisms right through to these large-scale effectiveness trials, which are kind of real-world clinical trials. 
We look at early life stuff. We're doing a lot of work now and around, you know, what mums eat during pregnancy, how that influences their microbiome, how that influences the infant's microbiome, because we know that the microbiome of infants is not only very important for their immune development, but increasingly we see seems to be involved in brain development. So how do we optimise that? So we did a trial at the Royal Children's Hospital showed that a gut-focused intervention where explained to mums who were pregnant why the gut was important, what they should do to improve their gut. The infants had a different microbiome profile, but what we saw was that that way of talking about diet that had nothing to do with body weight or gestational diabetes or all the things that are normally discussed really helped the women to shift their diet Mm. and become more healthy. And so now we're doing a big scaled up version of that trial that's just about to start. But we're doing a lot of studies. So seems that way. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Police. I mean, so, so fascinating. That was just amazing. Thank you. There's so so much much that I haven't even discussed. So you have to look at the Food and Move Centre website and our socials to see the the new studies that will be coming out this year because they're pretty cool. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, It's. I mean, just thank you for all the work you've done. It's truly life changing for so many people. It's just incredible. I feel incredibly privileged to have been able to do what I've done and it comes from a very deep-seated anger (laughs) at our current food system, industrialised food system, which costs the planet and the humans in it at least $20 trillion a year. Now, that's the bare minimum. This is not taking into account a host of other things that should or could be included but uh, $11 trillion in the cost to human health, it's a leading cause of illness and early death, $7 trillion in the cost to the environment, it's a leading cause of biodiversity loss, and those two things are linked. Monoculture that destroys the microbes in the soil and the, the micronutrient content, phytochemical content in food, that loss of biodiversity is directly affecting our biodiversity and loss of biodiversity in our gut. And uh, we are organisms that need a healthy environment and the food that we eat to be as nature intended. And the industrialised food system has done anything but herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, monocropping, intense cropping, destroying all the microbes in the soil, the bacteria, the fungi that get all those nutrients into the foods. The foods themselves are so limited, such poor quality. Then you've got the ultra-processed food. So our global industrialised food system is absolutely killing us and the planet. So that's the anger for me is that nothing is being done really to change this. And in the same way that climate change scientists get so frustrated at like, hello, we're looking at the end of the human race and you're just sitting there worrying about your profit margins. Mm. I feel the same about the industrialised food system. When I go to fill up my car with petrol and I walk in to pay and there are just walls and walls and walls of ultra-processed foods, that just makes me furious. Mm. It's not right that that is the 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 way things are at the moment. Yeah, mm. yeah. Unbelievable. Thank you so yeah. much. You oh, clearly have so much going on. You have so many <laughs> studies taking place. The, the fact you can take time for us today is it, it means a lot. So thank you so much. Um, it's lunchtime, so we're going to fill our bowl with three quarters a salad, uh, <laughs> some grains. I wouldn't get hung up on the proportions. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's been such thank a pleasure. You. Thanks for having me. It's fun.